All right, hello everyone and welcome um, to our panel discussion on OER textbook development at Norquest. My name is Nicole Carrier. I'm the senior editor in curriculum development and I'm also the copyright officer for the college. And uh, our panel today, we're going to discuss the different experiences of Norquest faculty who have developed OER textbooks. And we hope you'll find it interested, interesting, um, especially those of you who are thinking of starting your own OER publishing program. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the panel. I'll start with uh, Lisa Sturdy, who's, there you go. Uh, Lisa has a BSCN in uh, a nursing degree and has been at the college since 2009. She's worked in various areas, including the healthcare aid program, the Simulation Center, and Allied Health. She's currently an instructor with Health Administration and Technology, and she has a passion for teaching and is excited about OERs because they make education more affordable. Her partner in crime, Suzanne Erickson, um, is an instructor with Health Administration and Technology in the Medical Office Assistant and Hospital Unit Clerk programs. She and Lisa collaborated to create the two-volume OER, The Language of Medical Terminology. And volume one provides a thorough overview of not only medical terminology, but also other topics in the healthcare sen uh, setting. And volume two focuses on pharmacology. Uh, Suzanne also created the Communications uh, 1001 OER with co-author Sarah James. Oscar Vergara has been with Norquest College since uh, 2019 and is presently the chair of the Settlement Studies Program. He has extensive experience working within the settlement sector and with organizations that shape the landscape of services offered in Alberta. Oscar has been involved with OER textbook creation for the settlement program from its initiation. In 2019, he helped assemble a team of talented writers to create five chapters that would ultimately lead to the publication of the textbook, Canadian Settlement in Action, History and Future, the college's first OER. In recognition of the success of that publication, Norquest College has supported the addition of three more chapters for the textbook uh, in the fall of 2022, and further expansion of the textbook is planned. Oscar has said that the creation of the textbook is a highlight of his career, but emphasizes the collaborative effort that took place to complete the project. And last but not least, Alexandru Kolderaru is an associate chair and the program founder of the Settlement Studies Diploma Program at Norquest College. Originally from Romania, he has spent much of his life involved in movements struggling for socioeconomic equity and justice and working in occupations that support the integration of newcomers to Canada. He has a master's degree in educational policy studies from the University of Alberta and is currently also serving as the elected president of the Northwest College Faculty Association. Oh, he was. I guess he's the past president. So before we get into the panel discussion, I just want to give a, an overview of OERs at Norquest College. So beginning in 2016, the Norquest College Curriculum Development Department began encouraging faculty to use OERs in their courses. And by 2020, more than 20 courses were using open textbooks. That number is much higher now. Since the average Alberta student spends at least $4,000 on textbooks during their studies, and that number is taken from a 2014 Government, Alberta, Government of Alberta report, the college believes it's imperative to further increase OER textbook ad adoption. Re research shows that most students delay purchasing textbooks. 65% of post-secondary students elect not to purchase textbooks. 50% choose majors based on textbook prices. 13% have considered dropping their courses because of textbook prices. And these statistics come from the 2020 Horizon Report by the nonprofit association Educause. So in 2020, the Students Association of Norquest College asked that the college prioritize OERs. And in 2022, Norquest adopted an institutional OER policy. This policy provides faculty with guidelines for the creation and adoption of open materials, including license conditions for OERs released through Norquest, and how faculty time and resources would be dedicated to OER development. 
That same year, Norquest continued to reach out to other provincial and international organizations involved in the development and promotion of OERs and joined the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, an organization for colleges interested in OER development and networking. Uh, Norquest began to explore funding opportunities and applied for OER development grants from various organizations and foundations. The goal is by 2030, more than 80% of Norquest college programs will be Z-cred, meaning that they will have zero textbook costs to students. We're currently publishing three to four OERs per year, and our OER textbooks have been well received at both Norquest and at colleges and universities across Canada. Our OERs are created using the Pressbooks platform, which we access through Open Education Alberta, and both Pressbooks and OE Alberta are hosted through the University of Alberta. So, I don't know who wants to start, but um, we could start with Lisa and Suzanne. How did you decide to create an OER? What initiated your projects? And what was the, pr uh, the process of putting together your textbook? Okay, I can start. Um, the initiation of the project was actually our chair came to us and spoke to us about um, creating an OER for medical terminology. Um, Suzanne and I at the time thought it was a wonderful idea, but also a bit overwhelming idea um, because we kind of spoke about it in December and the plan was to have that project done by June. Um, Suzanne and I are both full-time instructors, so we knew this might be a little bit of an issue. Um, and actually it was Andrew that said, do not do it off um, the side of your desk. You're going to need more time than that. So um, fortunately enough, we got funding, and um, this allowed Suzanne to work on the project um, outside of regular work hours and get paid to do so. Um, so she started the project ahead of time, and then I joined her kind of in, in March. And then we had April to June um, to finish the project. I'm not saying that... Um, it still wasn't a lot of work, but it sure did ease the workload, having the opportunity to have that extra money um, to allow her to do it. So I guess our advice that was given by our colleague was um, appropriate. Otherwise, it, um, you can't really do it alongside a full-time position if you have a, a really strict deadline. I don't know if you remember the second part of the question. Maybe you could repeat the second part of the question. What was the process of putting the textbook together? Uh, well, it was um, a lengthy process, but a creative process nonetheless. Um, and it involved a lot of collaboration with other areas, uh, curriculum development, our, our editor, of course, uh, Nicole, um, and then, of course, our, our peer reviewers as well. So a lot of it was chapter by chapter and kind of planning it out that way and kind of completing it in smaller chunks, which made it more bearable. And I think most of our time um, was spent looking for resources. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you can use what is already created, because um, there's lots of OERs out there that teach on medical terminology, we would look to those first. And I think Susanna and I were talking about, it was kind of like a puzzle. We would find one main one, and that would lead you to another one, because they would reference another OER. <laughs> so it was really cool to kind of find all these resources within one resource. So if you can find that on your topic, it certainly makes the project, not saying easier, but it does make it more manageable, I would say. Thank you. Um, Oscar and Alex, what initiated your project? Um, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, well, we were a little bit different. We were, we were lucky that um, we, we knew we were funded um, to do the OER for settlement studies. And, um, and so that enabled us to work on the process and um, start uh, really planning how we wanted to get it done, uh, who we were going to hire, because ultimately it, it comes down to the subject matter experts and writers who, um, who are already in the industry, some of who we already employ in our faculty, so we were lucky that way as well. Um, so, so for us, it wasn't um, that much of an uphill battle for the funding, but definitely getting the processes in place and uh, hiring the writers and and kind of putting it all together to uh, ensure that it's uh, it's a 
a good contribution to the college and you know we're doing right by um, by the learners yeah I think for us um, in the set program um, we have the benefit of still being a relatively new program so our program launched in the fall of 2019 and it launched as a result of a gap analysis that we had done as a result of an internal project at the college where we actually found a niche a, a you know, in terms of the labor market that this program could fill. It also um, identified a, a, a gap in a lot of the academic literature. There's not a whole lot of uh, literature existing out there to deal with settlement workers or supporting newcomers to Canada from a settlement work-based perspective. And settlement work itself is interdisciplinary in scope, but it is distinct. So you can't just pull from, from social work, you can't just pull from intercultural uh, uh, consult, consultation, you can't just pull from community development. You know, you pull elements of all that, but the sum of its parts are something entirely different. So we viewed the, the creation of the OER as just an extension of the actual creation of the program itself which was to fill a gap not just in the labor market, not just in the student market, but also in the academic literature as well. So for us, because we already had done a lot of that work in building the program a, as a whole and we knew these gaps existed, it was a little bit easier for us than taking something that was pre-existing and adapting it and so forth. Um, and uh, we were fortunate in that way that it was, it was fairly quick in the way it was able to come together and in our instance it was very it was properly resourced which makes a huge difference yeah what was your process because it was quite different from Suzanne and Lisa's yeah our, our, um, our process was um, was putting out a call for proposals um, basically what, what whatever people could get from our, our website um, and based on the information on the website we would ask uh, for people to give us proposals on the topics that they wanted to write about um, and of course internally we had uh, we had faculty members that we thought would be really good um, at writing some of these pieces so Alex uh, has actually ri written two um, two chapters which are on the OER right now he's working on his third um, and so based on the content of, of settlement studies and, and um, what we actually um, learn about in settlement studies could be uh, addressed in the OER through special topics. So right now it's, it acts more of a, as a supplement to the material and content that are in the courses. But ultimately the goal is to, you know, to um, have world domination and have, the, have our OER uh, spread out universally and uh, cover settlement work in general. And I think just to add to that, I think one of the things that was touched on in the presentation prior was the team that extended beyond just the project leads and the SMEs. We were really well supported by instructional designers and the instructional design team that really kind of helped us navigate press books so that Oscar and I wouldn't have to fumble our way through it uh, on, an, on its own. And it's, I know that that hasn't been the universal experience at Norquest, so for for us, it was smoother in part because when I say it was resource, not just money, but also, you know, communal expertise to make this be, uh, you know, a real team effort. Because I, I don't know where we would have been without the instructional designers. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. It, this, they really, really worked a l long and hard. And they probably don't get the credit they do for these OERs the way that the SMEs do, but it wouldn't be possible without them. So for those who actually do the design and the uploading the content and everything, that's like three jobs into one. So extra tip of the cap. Yeah, just to add to that, the um, I, it's press books uh, for the platform that we use. And um, it's really hard to find an expert mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in press books, but we were able to to do, find that internally through uh, through Robert Lawson and um, and his team and, and people like Nicole who uh, contributed and, and helped out with that because Pressbooks is not something that I, I use on a daily basis or would even dream of <laughs> trying to uh, to do anything on it. But I did have to learn um, the hard way and and um, we kind of, we all kind of encountered it uh, in our own way and, and took it took it as it was and 
uh, use it to our benefit. I, I think in the end, if you if you go to the website and you actually, or you go to the OER textbook, um, like you'll, you'll see, it's not just uh, a bunch of chapters put together. It's uh, chapters with interactive activities with uh, all sorts of, of really neat things that you can do depending on on uh, your learning ability and it is geared towards uh, adult learners so um, it, it's written with that in mind so yeah definitely the um, the developers and the help that we got from uh, from uh, Pressbooks people as well so yeah Suzanne and Lisa how did how easy did you find it to use Pressbooks <laughs> or, um, I found it relatively user friendly, but I did spend pretty much because I started uh, on the project a bit before Lisa, um, just because of the way it worked out. Um, I spent like the first month watching YouTube videos on how to do it and finding resources and kind of figuring it out on my own and then playing with it. So I did have to have that time to be able to do that in order to figure it out before we even started working on the project. Yeah. But I would say um, the big playing in it, once you're playing it, it's so easy to use. And I did mention in our previous uh, talk that we were kind of told not to do it on a Word document and bring it in, to actually build within uh, Pressbooks. Because um, we did talk about how on uh, the dashboard, which is kind of like your editing page, it will look one way, but then when you put it in preview, which is what your actual students will see or whoever's using your textbook, um, it will look different. So you just had to make sure um, that you played around with the settings in textbook in the textbook, like maybe adding a space where an image is, because it kind of can end up here or there. But it's just playing around in it. But once we got a handle of it, mm -hmm. it's actually very user friendly. Yeah. So you've spoken about the advantages of having instructional designers to help you out. Um, you know, and I, I edit most of the OERs at at Northwest Colleges part of my role in curriculum development. Are there any other resources that you felt you could have had and didn't? Yeah, I think that one of the things that in hindsight now, um, going back is a little bit more on uh, making things more accessible for students with disabilities. I think, uh, I, and I don't think that's just for us. I think that's just, for those of us who don't have disabilities, that's a very obvious blind spot, and it's one that we often have to be reminded of over and over and over again, which I wish it wasn't so, but it is. Um, so I think that that's something that, for me, um, is a little more top of mind now, um, and I think that those are just conversations going forward in OER development that we need to have college-wide, if not sector-wide. And I think we'll agree because we actually talked to Robert about our images and we went back in and edited them and made sure we um, described what the picture showed. Whereas when we first initially made the test textbook and put it out, we didn't do that. We did it on some, but we weren't consistent. But then we went back in and made it more consistent, so. Yeah, and um, just for, for those of you who are wondering who the Robert is who keeps getting mentioned, <laughs> he's sitting at the back of the room and Robert, Robert is an instructional designer and OER specialist at Norquest College and was instrumental in bringing the OE Global Conference to Norquest and to Edmonton. So say thanks, Robert. We couldn't do it without you. Not all heroes wear capes. Yes. Um, how often do you do maintenance because OERs typically incorporate a number of multimedia elements, embedded videos, links, and sometimes these things go away or break, or sometimes the OERs need to be revised, which is one of the big advantages is they can be updated on a regular basis. So how do you keep track of things? How often do you do maintenance? For us, we're teaching the course, so we're constantly maintaining our current textbook that we're using, both of them. And, and I, I think I said it in my talk, our students are great at editing and telling us if something doesn't work. Um, so if it doesn't, we can um, fix it in, pre in the, not in preview, but in the dashboard, and then we just re-upload it if there's an issue or a concern. Thankfully, we haven't had really any concerns with any of the videos, but I'm sure it will come up, because some of them are YouTube links, so they'll let us know. 
Okay, I was going to, uh, to just say that um, it's the next big question to address. It's the ne next big step because it's so new. We just developed uh, our, our, you know, eight chapters. Or we're adding three more. Uh, but we know that coming around the corner, at some point, there's going to have to be some some checks, some maintenance, and, and updates. And so um, that's the next, that's our next phase, I, I, I guess you could say. Um, so it's not forgotten. We don't go in there regularly to, uh, to tweak it or anything, but um, I do go in there once in a while to just read and to make sure. And I, I do keep track if anybody alerts me to anything that might be out of sync or not working. And so that, that's what we're relying on right now. But hopefully we'll have um, a better formal process in place uh, coming up in this next year after we, <laughs> we add a, a few more chapters and then we'll take a look. But very important to everybody, everybody who's worked on it ha has asked us, you know, the, the same question. So it's at the top of mind for sure. And the students, whenever we use it in class, mm. um, that is, uh, our, our learners are great at letting us know when, uh, when things aren't working. Yeah. So like Suzanne and, uh, and, um, and Sarah, we haven't uh, encountered any broken links yet because we're only about two years in after publication, but um, it's coming. Do you have a review process in place to ensure the quality of the content? Yeah, we, uh, uh, for sure, for, for the settlement studies, we, we have um, our, our subject matter experts come in to, um, to build the content and to, to work with um, instructional designers to uh, ensure their activities are, are working. Um, then there's a couple of reviews that take place um, when the content is submitted. So it'll get reviewed a uh, minimum of, uh, I would say, three or four times, sometimes more, depending on, on how much help the writer needs or, um, you know, somebody who's, who's quite brilliant may not need too many interactions. Right, Alex? Um, <laughs> um, so, so it really just depends on, the, on, on what the needs are of the, that particular chapter. But definitely there's a, a, a few iterations and, um, uh, it's, it's something that it wor we work on. Uh, when we're doing the development of the OER chapters, it's something that we, we work on pretty much daily. It is a peer review and it's a blind process. So part of the hiring process that happens is that there's been a call out that goes out for content editors that we've used in the SET program. And so when I submit my chapters, uh, I've n I haven't really learned who my, edit my editor is. They could be from the community. They could be a colleague from within the, co the college. Um, but the results are given. <laughs> the results are given, and, uh, and you, we usually do that process two or three times before we're ready to publish. Our, our process was a, a little bit different. Uh, we uh, created the content ourselves, put it into press books, then the other one of us would, would review it as a first review. Then, of course, through through Robert in curriculum development, Nicole as editor, and then we actually uh, found uh, two peer reviewers uh, for each book, and it was uh, different individuals for both uh, from other areas of the college. Then they'd review it and then we'd um, make changes as a result of that. Yeah, one of the reasons I brought up that question is because there's a persistent myth that OERs, because they are free, are not the same quality as a print textbook. Um, and this is not true, but like I say, the myth persists. I come from a background in textbook or trade book publishing, which includes textbooks. And uh, anybody can, have, can create a textbook and have it published. It doesn't even have to be peer reviewed as long as the publisher thinks they can make money from it. Textbooks are expensive to publish, and uh, a traditional print book publisher wants to know that they're going to get a return on their investment. And so I just want to clarify that just because something exists, well, textbooks not only exist in paper these days, but also as e-textbooks, but just because they come from a big publisher like Nelson or Wiley, does, that doesn't ensure quality. There are some really bad textbooks out there. It also speaks, I think, to a certain form of elitism out there to assume that only things produced within the academia are, you know, valid forms of knowledge. I think we've seen this 
at this conference here where, you know, some from our keynote speaker this morning, you know, land-based knowledge, right? Land-based learning. That is, how does, it, how does it not get any more open than that, right? And we're at a point right now where we're, we're reconciling the fact that community-based non-academic forms of knowledge have been marginalized and silenced. And I think open ed or OER resources are a great way to tap into that and to kind of break down that, that hierarchy that exists. So you're always gonna get pushback when you challenge things like that, but I think it's well worth the effort. I'm off the soapbox now. <laughs> That's okay, I think there are things that, that need to be said because like I say, there are, there are some persistent myths around OERs that need to, um, need to go away. So, um, lessons learned. Anything in particular? I think one thing that we learned is that um, building an OER is a big project and don't underestimate how long it will take to um, work on your project. Um, if you're offered to do a project, make sure you um, stick up for yourself and know that um, you need the time. If anything is gonna be your best friend, it's time. Um, and you need the time to work on it. If you don't have the time, then you may not make a product that um, suits your course, your program, or best suits your students. And that's what we're here for, is to build um, something better than a textbook um, for our students that you have to pay for that's free. Yeah, I think one of the, um, on, on, on really on a lighter note, um, one, one of the, the really neat things that we did um, that I'm particularly proud of, but doesn't, you, you don't really notice what, what happened in the background, but the, um, the OER textbook uh, book cover was created by one of our students and um, we had a competition and they, were, they all got into groups or they did it on their own or in pairs and they created a, a digital uh, artistic book cover and they were all great, they were all excellent and we got uh, faculty members and um, executive uh, leadership to, to kind of vote on the, uh, the various book covers. So, we were really proud of that, and that, that's something that I had never done before. I hadn't really engaged the students in that way, and um, they took it to heart. They did a great job, and um, we're, we're really proud of it, and you can see it on, on, on our OER. Yeah, I thought that was a really great idea. Um, one of the things that, that comes up occasionally is that having, having students assist in the, in the, the creation of OERs and have, you know, Co help to co-create resources. Is that something any of you have considered? I think in an indirect way it happens with the examples that you use. Oftentimes in my own writing process, um, I reflect on conversations I have in class with my learners. And when you redesign your own course curriculum, um, that's often a process as well. So I think a lot of the activities that we use in the set OER are influenced by interactions we've had in the community, in the classroom. Um, so I think that that is one indirect way. I don't think we've done it quite as directly as of yet, um, outside of the, uh, the textbook cover that Oscar referenced earlier and Whatnot, but uh, but it is some certainly something that is always on the on the back of our minds about how to do. I think there was something spoke about that this morning in one of the talks we were in about um, having the students build part of an OER for an assignment and using that way. Yeah, so I think that would be a great idea. But then again, that takes time, and you wouldn't you would have to know. Um, when you were putting it in the curriculum and when your big project was due. So if you could do that way ahead and then, you know, do it that way, I think that would be a great idea. And what does the future hold in terms of your next project? Any, <laughs> or would you do another project having, having completed a couple already? So Lisa and I did one OER uh, about a year and a bit ago, and then uh, we did another one last year together. 
Um, and I did another one with another group uh, last year as well. So I would love to do another one anytime. I love the challenge and, and the creativity. It's like the potato chips, one is never enough. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's actually, uh, Robert had sent us an email from a PSI in Ontario that was looking for a resource that went along with one of our OERs. So that's something that would be great um, to do as well. Mm -hmm. And if we ever get the opportunity or the time to build resources to go along with our OERs, we would love to take that opportunity on. So. We've slowly been getting um, attention nationally from, from other colleges who have um, decided to actually use some of the chapters in our OER for, for their studies as well. So we're really proud of that. And it, there's nothing to really stop that from expanding. And so we'd like to, we'd like every college to, <laughs> to adopt some part of the, the OER that we've developed. Um, that would be the dream. But I, I think ultimately, um, we want to keep adding to our OER as it is. Um, as I said, we're, we're working on three more chapters. Uh, so we'll, we'll be up to 11 chapters with the intention to ultimately allow that to replace the real textbooks. We only have a couple of textbooks that are, are mandatory in, in the program, um, but that would be nice to eventually eliminate and replace, not eliminate, but maybe replace um, with a brand new OER that's uh, completely functional and updated and um, really good reading for our students. Yeah, because we're working towards Z cred. Um, does anyone have any questions? You know, as they're reading the class, um, annotate them with hypothesis, and then uh, that gives me an indication of sort of what is. Where it's a, it's it's a way that they can collaborate a little bit. It's a way that I can get some feedback on quality control, um, and and the gaps in the things that they will annotate um, also kind of suggest to me where they might where it might really not be communicating to them. So that's something that, that I've, I've found effective. Um, I, I'd like to go back, um, Nicole, it kind of got by me quickly. How many do you want to have when of OERs? How many, how many courses, uh, what percentage? We're looking for, um, Norquest re recently published a document called Reimagine Higher Education. And the goal right now is that by 2030, 80% of the courses or 80% of the programs at the college will be Z-cred, meaning that the students will have zero textbook costs. And um, I don't, I, I'm unsure how many programs currently use OER textbooks, but um, our curriculum development department, one of the places we start with, especially with new programs, is to suggest to faculty that the first thing they look for for their courses are open educational resources. We don't force people to create any, but there are a lot, there's a lot of things out there, and I'm sure um, a lot of you are aware of, you know, OpenStax and LibreTexts, uh, eCampus Ontario, BC Campus. So there are a lot of resources and yeah because of the licenses too um, instructors can pick and choose from different oer resources and combine them for their courses congratulations that's a great goal yeah the few programs that suzanne and i teach in are textbook free now as of us creating three oers and i think in ours we have 16 courses and only two textbooks in them so and one of those is a novel. In the back. No, I do it. Well, we'll start with you.
yeah. take a stab at that one. I think one of the, it all comes down, and I, I think Lisa mentioned it really, it was time. Right. Like I think you need to people cannot work off the side of their desks and produce good quality work. And without the financial resources behind that time, um, you're going to struggle. I think that one of the things our sector is blessed with is really passionate, talented educators um, who will work themselves to the point of burnout to see a project through. But we don't want to be in a situation where that happens because then we'll lose that, that passion, that subject matter expertise um, for future projects. So I think that that's a really, really, really big one. And I think also, it also spreads out the, uh, not just the workload, but the responsibility and the ownership of the project. You don't want it concentrated in one or two hands. You want this to be a collaborative effort. You want people to feel invested in, in this because then all of a sudden then you have many people that wanna see this thing over the finish line. So I think, you know, that might involve, you know, a little bit of letting go of control, which in, is never a problem for academics. We're all, we all, we all have no issues letting go of things and trusting other, other folks, but that's, that would, be, <laughs> that would be my, how I would respond. And you had a question? Um, I'm going to go backwards. Um, our, our press books, once they're published, they live in a repository hosted at the University of Alberta called Open Education Alberta. And so it's like a giant bookshelf. And you can find them there. You can find them just with an internet search too. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the first question? The, the really interesting thing about um, the press books and the repository, because there are no technical protection measures on them, um, students can read them online, they can read them on different devices, they can print them up as PDFs. If a student has uh, a textbook from a typical publisher, they have access to the textbook for a limited amount of time only, either for the duration of the course or maybe for six months. Because even though, if you pay for a print textbook and you take it home from the store and it's yours forever, but if you pay for an e-textbook, you're not paying for the textbook, you're paying for a license to use the textbook. And you lose access to that after a while. Students lose access to that textbook. Also, there are technological protection measures in place that do not allow you to print e-textbooks. And so OER just have a lot more access. It's a huge advantage for students because you can, like I say, you can print them, you can put them on screen readers. Um, and it, it's, for me, having worked in traditional publishing, I think it's a huge advantage. And so students can, can access them pretty much any way they want. What we do is we offer a PDF and encourage students to print off their own copies if they want to. So it's, the, and the libraries will also print on demand, but we don't have copies on that for a couple reasons. One, um, that, that is a cost saving measure and also the environmental sustainability piece. If you're printing off, you know, 100 versions of 300 page textbooks, that's a lot of forests. Right, so we, uh, that's, it's part of our commitment, of our college's commitment as well to having a more paperless way of operating, that, that we kind of leave that open to students to kind of find their own ways to get hard copies. But they are available for anyone who wants them. Okay, mm -hmm. I think we've got time for one more question.
Bless you. Do you mean about the exercises within? Yeah, we, we don't. Actually, we kind of do because I think Robert was talking to us about our medical terminology OER. I think it's the, one of the top five in the U of A repository, so they must keep track. All right, so for, I don't know if everybody heard that, but Open Education Alberta tracks the, the usage or the download rates or uh, from books in their repository. Okay, and I think we're at the end of our time, so thank you all for coming. Thank you to everyone who participated in the panel. Thanks, everyone. And uh, yeah.